Welcome back to another episode on the Family Alpha Podcast. Today I'm joined by a special guest who likely needs no introduction, but still I'll go through the resume regardless, and that is Mike Cernovich. Mike is a husband, a father of two, a podcaster, and the author of the best-selling book, Gorilla Mindset, producer of the movie Hoaxed, and very relevant to today's discussion, he is a journalist in the front lines of the political arena that is going on in 2021 and beyond. With all that, Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Zach. My pleasure, brother. I appreciate you making the time to get on here. As we were saying before I hit record, I am not really involved in the political arena whatsoever, but a lot of my listeners are, and I understand how politics can play a role in our life. So we're going to talk a little bit about how family men can, can best maneuver and position themselves and their family to capitalize on what's to come. But before we dive into that, and for those who don't know your backstory, how did you go from running a blog to being involved in some of the biggest political stories and changes that we're seeing and that as a result right now we're living in. Yeah, the the way to think about it is I started as a lawyer, so I'd always written and read widely pr pretty much my adult entire adult life. I wasn't I thought I wasn't much for reader as a kid actually. I read the books he had to I guess for assigned reading and then got more into political philosophy and the weird stuff like behold the pale horse. Before there was conspiracy theories, the, the original book by William Cooper, and most of that, uh, that stuff didn't necessarily check out. But I'd always been interested in you know finding out the truth about the world, and I just wrote, I wrote for years. And writing, writing is like public speaking too. There's a, a video, Warren Buffett, who's actually a bad person for a lot of reasons, but this video is good. Whenever people ask him, well, what should I do? What, what's the number one thing I should do? They, ex they expect a, a better answer, I guess, but it's public speaking. Can you speak effectively? Can you write effectively? Can, can you communicate a message with a certain verve? And if you can do that, you can do it in any arena. It's simply just about knowledge of the specific domain. I could write technical manuals for nuclear submarines. It would take me a year and I would have to have a, an engineer help me, but I could communicate about anything. So I communicated about law, communicated about mindset, lifestyle, then, and I was anti-politics actually, that's the, the weird thing. People who know me like Jack Murphy from way, way back in the day, my, like I was Mr. If you care about politics, you can't, I, you can't even read my, my sites. I would tell people that. I would say, if you care if Barack Obama or John McCain wins the election, you're not worthy of my message. Don't even read me. You're such a that, loser. That's sort of where I'm at now. And I'm trying to break from that. So it's interesting you say that. Well, it kind of doesn't matter as much anymore, but it kind of does. So here's where the transition hits. The There's a line. There's all these little things that came out of Soviet Russia, little punch lines where you might not care about politics, but politics cares about you. That's unfortunately where we are as a country. Your Your kids are getting indoctrinated everywhere they go. There's open pornography everywhere you go. There's grooming children to, to get to OnlyFans the day they turn 18, right? Because if a girl goes, oh, can't wait to turn 18, OnlyFans, it's not like she learned about OnlyFans when she's 18 and she's thinking about it and then she's 25 because, you know, I, I diverge with a lot of conservatives in the sense that if you're 25 and you're doing something like that, hey, man, I don't really have anything to say to you. But you're 18, that's what you want to do. You've been groomed by society. So they're all being groomed for pedophilia. They're all being groomed for sex trafficking. They're all being groomed to sell their bodies as an 18 year old. And that's inescapable. You can say, I don't care about politics. I'm above it all, which is fine. I care much less about it, I guess, than I used to. But that was my perspective. Go to the gym. And, and by the way, that is my perspective for young men to this day. Aristotle had written in one of his political treatises, or maybe it was in the ethics, that you shouldn't have a political opinion until you're 35. Have you lived a little bit? Have you? Because otherwise, it's just theory. You're in college. You know, I know that you were in the Navy, but if people did the college route, you're 19. What is human nature? Nature or nurture? How the fuck do you? Fuck, fuck you. You know, <laughs> fuck, you don't know anything. You're a 19 year old and you have an opinion based on some stupid book you were assigned by a professor who has a point of view, you don't know anything. The idea that you're going to say, here's, here's how the geopolitical 
world is going to change. Here's how the chessboard looks. When you're 20, so you don't know anything. Play the chessboard of your own life. And that, so that was my perspective. And then I got sucked into the Donald Trump world because I was living in Paris at the time. It's a story I tell often. I'm becoming a boomer, repeating the same stories, but maybe your audience hasn't heard. But I was living the fucking dream, man. Honest to God. I was a writer living in Paris. That's what everybody, right? You read Hemingway or something. That's what everybody thinks is the pinnacle of, like you read a book and you would see the foreword from the author. And they always say where they wrote it. It's like I was fucking writing books in Vietnam, Paris. I was with Shauna. So I got, you know, traveling with an attractive woman. Money. It's like I'm printing money, like a printing press. No kids, no obligations, no real profile to attack because I would learn later and we could talk about this more. Once you go political, you're getting nuked. You're getting a tactical nuke dropped on your fucking head. So I had none of that. It was just amazing. Wake up. I'd walk to the coffee shop, write for two to four hours, go to the gym, and then Sean and I would sightsee and go to museums. That was my life, bro. And one night I was just taking a late night walk through the streets of Paris, which is quite romantic and rustic. When I saw the newsstand papered over with the magazine cover and it was all this orange thing. It was like orange yellow thing. I mean, what's that? Well, it's Trump on the newsstand. That's the level of penetration he had in 2015 when he announced that he was going to run. So I'm thinking, okay, well, Trump's obviously going to do well. You can't have that level of mind penetration and not do well. So I tweeted out, yeah, Trump will probably come in first or second in the Republican primary. Ted Cruz is a little bit smarter. We'll see what happens. That was it. Not some huge political guy. I start getting lit up. You fucking idiot. You don't know anything about politics. Who are you? You're just a steroid. Because I was a pretty big guy at the time, too. You're just a steroid user, meathead. Duh, you know, you name it. And then I just started, I got sucked into the vortex in June 2015. And everybody got sucked into the vortex of Donald Trump and American politics. And then I just started writing and explaining to people why he was going to win. And then one, you know, one thing led to another. But it all, it all comes down to fundamental life skills, right? The can, can you write well, effectively? Not even, I mean, I think that I'm one of the greatest living writers in terms of a style, a style. The... I'm not saying you have to be able to write like that, but can you write? Can you communicate your thoughts? Can you put your thoughts to paper? Can you explain to other people in a persuasive way why they should join on with you or why they should trust you or why they should believe you? Ethos, pathos, logos, the Aristotelian rhetorical method. All of this stuff I learned and studied for decades. Then, because the number one thing I would get from people is, wow, Cernovich came out of nowhere, right? And I thought, okay, so I'm 38, so I'm fucking old, and I'm a lawyer, graduated law school, got great grades in law school. I've written every kind of legal brief from shitty little parking ticket things to Supreme Court briefs. No, I didn't come out from nowhere. I'm just writing about something new, motherfuckers. Like, I wrote a best-selling book on mindset, guerrilla mindset. Really, really hard thing to do. So, no, I didn't just come from out of nowhere, but that's how people see it because they don't see everything that you did beforehand, they only see the end product. And then they assume whatever that end product is, was almost like magic. Whoa, who's this guy? Where'd he come from? How's he do these things? I don't know, live three and a half decades. And my early life was pretty hard. You'll end up somewhere. Yeah, I think that's a testament to, you know, it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. You know, you had put in the reps and positioned yourself for that. You know, yeah, when you get older, all the cliches are true, right? Yeah, you, you can start seeing them play out. But I wonder how much of that did you know you were doing in the process? Looking back, you can say, well, I positioned myself to do well, but did you know you were positioning yourself when you were taking the actions you were taking? Oh yeah, I lived very deliberately. I grew up poor, bipolar mom, on welfare a couple of years, dad worked factory jobs, loving home, no child abuse or anything like that. I think I've been listening to David Goggins' audio book. The child abuse scenes are there, almost too much for me, man. I almost broke down crying. I was at the gym listening to it. I'm like, dude, I, I wasn't trying to get this, man, because I, everybody's like, you got to listen to Goggins' book. And I was like, all right, I'll because I listen to audiobooks and I lift weights now. And I mean, he, he's, he, got it, he got it bad. So I wasn't anything like that, but you, I grew up pretty poor and it was a pretty bad life. Got bullied a lot. 
And I learned early on that if you live deliberately with purpose, practice, you put in the reps, you do the drills, then you can write your own ticket in many ways. That's, that's why when I started training martial arts, I learned, well, if you train harder and you inflict more pain on your body than the other guy can, the other guy hasn't inflicted pain on himself. So people would like hit me and I was like, oh, okay, that's like nothing, right? That's nothing. And then the first time, you know, you're a kid, you get into fights. I had to fight. It was no, I don't want to glorify violence, but I had gotten a lot of fights. And it got to the point where they would hit me and I would laugh and that would just blast them. And I realized, oh, so you don't practice get hit in the face. You don't actually do the work. Then you realize that just as a little kid, you're like, okay, if you're hitting the heavy bag, the, you know, those over the ever last 60 pound heavy bags that sold, you have to wrap it in duct tape because they start to get tear, tearing up. You, you hit the heavy bag. The other guy's not hitting the heavy bags. The other guy's just some common thug, some street thug. Those guys aren't putting in the work. So you realize, okay, you put in the work, you can start steamrolling people. That's physical. And the same thing is mental. I read every kind of book on writing. Brian A. Garner's book, The Winning Brief, which is about legal writing, the elements of style, Stephen King's book on writing, Don't Let His Twitter Stuff Fool You, still a good book. The Art of Writing Well, I would dig up these old 18th century French books that were written, that were translated into English on rhetoric. Read Aristotle's book on rhetoric, which is kind of a slog. Aristotle's is a bit of a slog, his book on rhetoric is, but I just studied rhetoric all of my life. And it was, so it's very deliberate because I always knew that I wanted to do something with the written word. It was deliberate practice, deliberate training for your mind, same thing. And then I learned, hey, you can do that for mindset too. You can do that for how you believe in yourself or your goal setting, vision, visualization of life, self-talk, boom, 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 right? So everything, everything was very careful and deliberate to the point where now it's, it's, it, looks, it looks easy to people, right? I could stream for 10 hours, draw out all kinds of historical references, and they think it's easy, but it isn't. I put in the thousands and thousands of hours of deliberative skill and practice. Well, it's like watching any professional athlete. It's easy to catch that ball or throw that pitch. Well, you don't see the, the literally thousands of pitches he's thrown to be able to throw that one pitch, you know? You know yeah, you don't see the practice. You don't see the hard work. You don't see the dedication. You don't see on Friday night when other people are going out, I didn't. I didn't believe that I had earned it. I believe that leisure was something you had to earn. In college, I wasn't out. I would go out at most maybe once a month. I realized that I wasn't able to, and I had no safety net in a way. I was either going to make it or, or fail. I wasn't going to try hard, take a big risk, and then have mama bear and papa bear with that nice safety net for me. No, I was going to be a humiliating failure if I didn't make it. So that was always my mentality. That was always my mindset going into things that I just have to work hard. And I would always work harder than other people. I would always outwork people on something that I wanted to do. You know, as I, there, there's so many angles you can take that down. I think there are a lot of men who need that message and listening to your podcast, you know, they can find that on this one though, you know, spinning it to family, you have two daughters now, you know, and, I, and I've, I've heard a few of your comments on how it sort of changed your perspective on things. You know, you, you think, you know, and then you have a child, you really know childbirth and, and what it is to be a father. You know, how has that impacted your journey and where it is you're going with it? Is two, two answers. One is on a meta level, it's made me more compassionate for just how hard it is for a lot of people to work because we have an idyllic life. I, I work from home. Shauna doesn't work, takes care of the kids. And it's easy to be a good parent in that environment. It isn't, oh, are we going to be able to make rent today? Oh, are the kids going to, because I grew up, maybe we get Christmas presents, maybe we wouldn't. One, one year for my birthday, we were so poor, my parents couldn't afford cake mix, not even Betty Crocker cake mix, right? And I remember hearing them like talk about it and the level of empathy that I have for how much it must have hurt, you know, my dad, especially just to be a man, you want to be, you want to be proud and you're broke. And it's very hard to, to maybe have those feelings of adequacy when you're living like, so I have a tremendous amount of empathy for people. And that influences my politics, especially with my views on the lockdowns and other things. You realize, dude, this is some guy's 
50 years old. He's got two kids, man. He built his business his whole life. And you're telling him, go to hell? That your business doesn't matter? Some rioter burns down his business? Doesn't matter? But we have to cry for the Capitol building, which is taxpayer funded? Should be the opposite, right? The, the Capitol incident riot, people call it they want. I don't care what the term they use is. That's all taxpayer funded stuff. I care more about the, the black lady who had her business burned down, she's in her 30s, has two kids. Nothing. Now she's got nothing. I grew up with nothing. I know what that's like. But those are my people. Those, who I th- those are the people I think about when I talk about politics, when I talk about the future of America, when I try to move America in the right direction. That's the, the bigger picture that's influenced me politically. On a personal level, you learn your bad habits, brother. You learn. I learned that I was not eating necessarily very healthy. How do you know? Well, I go to the fridge, Cyrus said, hey, dad, can I have a piece of chocolate? And I realized, oh, she, she's just doing what I'm doing. They're a mirror. She knows that I'm going to go grab a little piece of chocolate, and I'm doing that four or five times a day. That's her getting that from me. Everything that I'm doing is a mirror now in her. If I'm in a bad mood, they're going to think that you're in a bad mood because of them. And they're going to think, what did they do wrong? So you realize that if I'm in a situation where I'm in a wound up, I can't just go in and see my kids because they're going to think, oh, why is dad mad? Is he mad at me? No, no, no. I have to, I have to take my mindset level to an even, even deeper place because now it's not just about me and my own happiness and my own meaning in life. It is just, just about my relationship with Shauna or my relationship with people who listen to my podcast or read me. It's about my children who didn't choose to be here. That's how I view parenting fundamentally. Your kids didn't choose to be here. You made that choice for them. That means you have to be a better person. That means you have to rise to the occasion. It isn't like they're adults because the way I always looked at things with my podcast, and I would tell people this, I go, here's what I do. Do it or don't do it. You're an adult. You have to decide. And if you did it and it didn't work, I wouldn't feel guilty. I wouldn't feel like I gave you bad advice. I would say, what are you talking about? Listen to my message. My entire message is here's what I, you know, here's what I've done. I've done Trenbolone. You know, I thought it was pretty cool. I liked it. I'm not telling you to do Trenbolone. So don't, don't go do Trenbolone and then say, well, Cernovich said it's great. And I got this (laughs) horrific cough. No, you're an adult. You have to make your own choices. But with the kid, with children, I always think is, am I, am I saying what is true? Is what I'm, cause I can't pass the buck. I can't say, especially because my audience is men too. So I'm, I would just say, look, you're a man, be your own man. Here's what I do. Here's what I think. If you don't agree with it, fine with me. If you agree with it and you do it fine, but don't, if, if you win, don't give me the credit. And if you lose, don't give me the blame. You're a man. You make your own choices with the kid. You're thinking, am I really telling them the truth about the world? Which means, do I know the truth about the world? Which means I have to strive harder. I have to learn more. I have to elevate my own game every day because you're passing on knowledge to your children because a uh, thing that I said you can you can only teach your kids what you know right that works two ways my parents didn't know shit about life uh, even when I started getting successful like I burned through my money like I would get rich and then have no money all of a sudden I had these terrible financial habits so my fucking parents were never like no here's how you track cash flow you know three good months doesn't mean that's a, a, a year three good months means three good months your next month might fall off a cliff And then after you've been in business for a while, you realize, yeah, that's the truth. Things out of your control will happen, right? Like COVID, for example, that was outside of the control of the business owner. So if they were living large off their businesses, thinking it was always going to be this way, they're in a bad place. And that's, again, what you you learn. So you can only teach your kids what you know, which means you have to know more if you're going to be a parent, especially a father. I'm really glad you took that angle. You know, so the sponsor of this podcast is uh, peacefulfathers.com. The guy who runs it, his name's Anthony Migliorino. And his whole angle is on peaceful parenting, connecting with your children, speaking to them like the future adults they'll become and whatnot. You know, and you see that a lot. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up that angle of the small business owner. And it's funny, I didn't realize that's how I thought of it or why I thought of it that way. But that's exactly correct. You know, I look at them and I'm like, dude, that's a mom. Like, like if I were running a small business and it got torched or what the hell ever and shut down, or, you know, unessential or inessential, whatever term, you know, that's, I was feeling for them. I was like feeling that. And I'm like, man, that's sort of what sent me down this path of sort of paying attention to politics. 
You know, I was, it was never my thing. You know, I was about masculinity. I was about fatherhood. I was about family, you know, and just being your, the best man you can be, you know, and all of a sudden I'm like, well, these decisions that are happening at that level are now impacting my world. You entered my world of, of trying to build these families and stronger. So now how do I defend against this enemy unless I learn about them? And yeah, I mean, I had a weird, almost a vision one day where I had my daughter and I was talking her in into her crib, Syra, my first one. She's maybe six to nine months. And I imagined, or I saw it, or it was like I said, a vision, maybe from God. And I saw the roof of her house torn off in a bombing. And I thought, well, when we bomb people in Syria, the Middle East, that's what we're doing. We're destroying families. This is genocide. This is terrible. So I'd always been, um, I won't say, yeah, I'd always actually been against the Iraq stuff, but it was always practical. I wasn't against the war in Iraq because for some like haughty moral purpose, I just thought this is going to be a boondoggle. The generals are all fucking losers, as you know, the admirals and shit. They're all fucking, you, you know, when you're a kid, you think they're all General Patton. That generation is <laughs> gone. There are, there are no General Pattons left. As I just knew that if we went, it was going to be a waste of taxpayer money. It was going to be a big grift for the Cheneys. All the people at the top were going to get rich. People like me who grew up working class were going to get their legs blown off. And that was kind of that. But I never really thought like, no, those are people. Those are fathers right there. Fathers. Now, imagine you don't have, you're walking around as a refugee. I wonder if your daughters are going to get molested by some traffickers. And you were working. The Middle East was quite nice before the U.S. started messing with it. We, in the U.S., we think, oh, it was like barbarism or something. It just wasn't. That so much ignorance, cultural ignorance on the part of Americans put in there by the media, because the media, you learn, does, they're the biggest sociopaths in the world. And you realize that they were destroying families, man. That's what we're doing. When we do this shit. So if we're going to go to war, like a real war, then you have to say, that's what you're doing. You're, do you're destroying families. You're destroying children. Is it worth it? Maybe. I mean, wars sometimes are just. There is a just war theory. There is a time and a place for war. Certainly not now. And that was another reason I, I, I knew that I had to fight for Trump because I knew Hillary Clinton wanted to start a war with Syria. And I knew there would be hundreds of thousands of children orphaned, trafficked, sold into slavery, molested by the pedophiles, many pedophiles who are in fact, you know, Americans. And that's one thing you learn too, is why they want those wars. It creates more vulnerable victims. It destroys society. It upends the family structure because you can't groom kids who are in strong families, right? Sex trafficking, I don't want to say never, but it rarely happens when you have a strong functional family, involved parents, it almost never happens. Broken homes, criminality, same thing too. Criminality, even in the U.S., broken homes. And I don't, I don't, you know, some guys like to blame single moms and I don't do that. And that's another thing that I become less glib about because I, how, me as a single dad, holy shit. Could you imagine that? Two kids, three kids, shuffle, just get them in the car seat, right? And I'm, I'm fully, so parenting for me is hard. I'm in way above average shape. So I'm in good shape, higher, you know, smarter than the average bear resources. And there are days where I'm like, fuck, man, <laughs> fuck. And I only have two. So imagine again, you're a single mom and you're trying to do all that and you don't have any money. You don't know what's going to happen. This is a big mess. So that's why I've been, I, I become like super pro family, super pro. Like, what are we doing for families as a society? Everything's about the family. Fuck the rich. I don't care about fucking tax. Tax, oh, your taxes might go up. I don't give a fuck about any of that shit. I always think about the family formation as a culture. But then the flip side too is where this le leaps back to where you are maybe in terms of politics and where I was years ago too is if you can't set the example, I don't want to fucking hear shit about politics. I, if you're a fucking slob, if you're not doing anything in life, I don't give a fuck who you think should win the election. Sorry. And I tell people that to their face. I'll, I'll tell people, you do not have an opinion in my world. You are not entitled to an opinion because you can't even self-govern, right? You can't even self-govern. You can't even auto-regulate. You can't even control your emotions. You can't even not just get wound up or mad. You're afraid to go ask a woman out on a date. You're afraid to do legs. I don't have any interest in what you have, even if they're right, right? Even if, if, they're on, on my team or whatever. I'm like, but I don't care. You, you might think that you know something, but you don't. So governance starts with what? Self-governance. 
And then the reason I became so successful in politics is because I walked the walk, right? I don't just tell people, hey, man, take care of your life, dude. I'm taking care of my life. You meet me in person, you know this is a guy who is doing things. This is somebody who is handling his life. This is somebody who's doing the work. This is somebody, again, do the work. There is a, I've, I've always believed that a couple things, one, drillers are killers. Drill everything. How do you want to become a better writer? Drill. I don't know what to write. Write the same sentence a hundred times. Well, I'm bored. Then you're a fucking pussy. No, I don't give a fuck. You're bored. How old are you again? Right? You always hear that. Well, I don't want to do that. I would drill. So in law school, I wanted the highest grade in a class, in a competitive class. I would drill. I would read all these old uh, exams from the past, and I would type the answer three, five, three to five times. Right? Over and over and over. So everybody else was goofing off or just reading it to try to comprehend. I would drill. So then when I would sit down to the test, if I saw a similar question show up, I didn't even have to think. I drilled that thing. And you learned that from the military, right? Amateurs train until they get it right. Professionals train until they can't get it wrong. Hope I said that right. Yeah. Amateurs train until you get it right. Professionals <laughs> train until you can't get it wrong. The drillers are killers. If you train wrestling, same way. You're going to go for that takedown. That's all you're going to do for three hours, right? You go to jujitsu. All you're going to do is try to pass guard. All you're going to do, at least, you know, where I trained, it was a little bit more old school. Guard passes. Once you pass the guard, you return to guard. None of this. I'm going to pass guard, try to submit, just roll free roll. No, you're going to drill this over and over and over again. But that's really everything in life. If you want to be a better writer, write the same sentence a hundred times, write it a thousand times. I got bored. Good. Then you'll think of something else to write because your mind doesn't like to be bored. Your mind, that's why your mind is saying, let me go grab this thing. No, your mind will come up with more stuff because it, it's going to want to fill that vacuum. Same thing. Well, how do you be a public speaker? Go look in the mirror and talk. And then that's where you get into the whole resistance. I don't want to do it. And that's where you lose me because the minute you say, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I don't want to work for me. That's you being weak. That's you being pathetic. And I don't, I don't have time for, for any of that kind of stuff. And that's always been my approach. And that's why my guys always tended to be a little, a little bit above, you know, a little bit above, like you could always, if there were meetups or whatever, people would hold like joint meetups. You could always tell who was a Cernovich guy. There, there was no, there, I wouldn't say there's a hierarchy because we were never really about hierarchy, but you could be like, okay, that's a Cerno guy right there. Well, how could you tell? Almost 100% chance that he lifted. This is pre-politics. Um, if, you, if you read me, there's like almost 100% chance you lift weights. Unless you have some kind of physical condition, which some people have and they can't, and I respect that. They have their own struggle. God bless them. Just getting out of the day, get, getting up is a struggle for them, and I respect them too. The idea, though, is you're, you're doing your work. You're, you're reading more than the average bear. We're like NPR readers who lift. Right. If I were saying what's a, what's a who's a Cernovich reader, I would say we're we're the NPR people, but we actually lift weights, and you could tell, and it showed. And then that's why I was able to to marshal and rally so much support when I was doing political organizing, because people want to follow a leader, but you have to be a leader, right? That's the key. So become a leader. Become a leader. Can you lead yourself though? Okay. Why would anybody else follow you? Can you lead your family? Because you can't use force. I'm a peaceful parenting too. Never spank the kids. We don't yell at them as a way to dress them down. We don't do that. Why well, that, that kind of stuff? Everything is about why. What? How'd you get to this situation? If the kid's crying, oh, what happened? Mommy was this. It's like, oh, well, wait, mommy was that. What really happened? Oh no. So you threw a cup at your sister's head, and we told you that was the wrong thing to do. And you can see children how they form victim patterns. Early on, oh, you you did this thing to me. No, 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 no. You set off the sequence of events that led you to where you are. So everything we do is very myth mythological. Everything is about peaceful parenting. Everything is about having the child analyze where they are emotionally, how they got into that situation. But we always go back to what they did. But then the flip side is I've apologized to my daughters more than I've ever apologized to another human being in my life. Because sometimes you interpret the situation wrong. You go, oh, I thought you had thrown the cup, but actually what happened is you slipped and then the cup fell. So then it was not even your fault. So I was actually wrong to, to take that different approach. So everything is about collaboration, 
And if you can lead children, then that's the same way you have to deal with other people. You can't dress down people. You can't insult people. I mean, I do on the internet if they want to talk trash, but <laughs> if you're forming a team or doing collaboration, everything is about finding, and nine out of 10 times, it's you, you started the situation. Nine out of 10 times, you were the, you were the pool cue, right? And you hit the balls in a play. And you want to pretend you weren't the pool cue. You want to pretend you're one of these balls who was caught in some random Newtonian mess. No, 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 no. So here's what you did. So we always work our way back to the first cause. We help them see how they got in that situation. And then we help them avoid that situation in the future. But that's life. That's mindset. That's parenting too. That's your own life. Why are you fat? Well, it could be that you're addicted to food because you need an endorphin rush because you don't exercise right? Maybe, or maybe it's something else we don't know, but we, we always analyze it that way. We always try to go back to the, fir, the Aristotelian like first cause. What's the first pool cue or the first ball on the pool table that got everything set to motion? Let's discover that and then let's analyze things from there. You know, how you dialed that back was perfect. You know, when you look at peaceful parenting, immediately it's, it's the, the father to the children or the parents to the children. But when I look at how I run my Twitter, how I run everything I do, there's a, a fatherly tone to it. How can I help you get your best? How can I help you see what's going on in the world? How can I help you better connect with the world and thus get the best in your life as you go forward? You know, and I think what happened to bring this conversation to even occurring was when COVID first hit, I take care of me. I'm, I've, I've locked myself in. I'm always working to improve, but I'm in a good spot. My relationship with my wife, fantastic. Our children, they're thriving. And then I went into the world, into my community. And I don't know if you know this. So I was writing under a pen name when I first started out. When COVID yeah, hit. I remember. All right. So I was, I was Hunter Drew. Because I was going to your podcast years ago and for your book club. And I think a couple of years ago, maybe. It was a while ago. Yeah. And for whatever reason, I lost track of it or it didn't happen. Or your book club. I think you were doing a monthly reading. You do yes. a different book a month. Yes. I remember you from back then. Awesome. So Fast forward to COVID, I was like, you know, I'm telling these people to connect. I'm asking them to be authentic. I was like, fuck it, guys, I'm Zach. My name's not Hunter Drew, you know, it's Zach Small. And I, I, I really took that approach on connection. And when I tried bringing it from the home to the community, I went to my town's engagement page and they were, they were ranting about Black Lives Matter. And I'm like, listen, we're all, all lives matter here. I was like, any form of police overreach or brutality or, or anything of the nature, I was like, is wrong against everybody. Like we should be looking at the government, not each other. And I was banned. <laughs> I was banned from my town's page. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, wow. We're trying to, to better ourselves. Our, our town is 98% middle-class white Americans. And we have a shrine to George Floyd in one of our main roads and all sorts of craziness. You know, it was just nuts. And I was like, what just happened? This is Rhode Island. You know, normally politics don't reach us. Maybe Providence, but that's it. You know, and yeah. I'm in the middle of like farmland, Rhode Island. So it really caught me off guard to where I saw how even though I, my family was locked in, my community was not. And that was a shock to me. And it, it really sent this down, you know, it kind of spiraled out from there. And I guess that presents the question I wanted to ask you is, what do you view the, the top issues that are coming down the pipeline, maybe in the, the next months, the foreseeable, you know, the years coming ahead that family men now should start paying attention to, to kind of get ahead of? That's a complicated question because the number one answer, the big picture is the culture, not just the attack on masculinity, but the attack on stay at home moms. As men, we are myopia. We all have myopia, right? Wherever, you know, whatever in group you're in, you have myopia and you tend to see things from the perspective of your in group. But you see that moms who stay at home get attacked. They're embarrassed to say they're a stay at home mom. I actually, Shauna would feel a little insecure about that because women try to make them feel insecure because they're not working. And I would say, well, you should ask them if they like doing PowerPoint presentations, right? For a man, essentially, most of the bosses are men. So there's that stigma. Everything is anti-family. So it's restoring the culture of family, putting family first. It's also restoring the culture of just being a badass dude, man. So much in life is about, and I get that men are, you know, a lot of men, they're demoralized and brainwashed by culture, but you have the internet, man. You can find, choose your own adventure. There, there really is that loss of, you can go do whatever you want 
if you're a young man with no obligations today, right? You can. What do you want to do? You don't need that much money to live. All these guys, oh, I want to make six figures. Okay, well, good. I'm not going to hate on that. That's going to be harder than you think, by the way, but I'm not going to hate on it. Flip side is, why don't you just try to make a little bit and become a more developed, self-actualized human being? Because skills compound. The more you learn compounds. Synergy is a word that I really kind of hate because corporate, because of the corporate buzzword, corporate bingo, we're going to find synergies. Conceptually, though, it's right. If you can speak and write, you're not one plus one equals two. You're one plus one equals 10. Very few people are effective speakers and writers. And the more that you write and the more you train your brain for the discipline of writing means that when I speak in my own mind on another layer, I'm actually writing what I'm going to say before I say it. I don't lose my train of thought. People have watched me do streams for eight hours, 10 hours. And I don't run out of things to say because of the discipline of writing, which rewires your brain, which is another lesson people have to learn, especially when you can rewire your brain. You, I don't know that you can add genius level IQ points, but you can add five, 10 IQ points. If you really train your brain and you train your working memory and you do the exercises and you do the drills, that's huge. If you add five IQ points, you're almost a different person. If you add 10 IQ points, you reach a level of intelligence that's so much smarter than your previous self that if you read what your previous self wrote, you would think that's a dumb person who wrote that. You're completely, you're completely different level. Everything is sort of like that. So that's why I always tell people is you can reprogram your brain. You have to use a methodology. You have to be smart about it. You have to be disciplined. I even show, and I have a in gorilla mindset even, and I have a complete system on how to, to study and learn new material, study and learn new information. So when you're not just reading a book for entertainment, you're, you're intaking that in a way that other people can't. And all, and all of that, all of that compounds. And then you end up, it takes a while though. A lot of people don't want to put the patience in. It takes a while, but you end up like pretty, pretty much have it together in life. doesn't mean life will be perfect. My life can still be very challenging in many ways, but you're, you're much more prepared for it. You're much more equipped for it. You age better, right? I'm 43 now. I'll be 44 this year. I, I know my body isn't what it was when I was 33 in terms of recovery, but I can still hang, right? I can still hang. It isn't the, used to be Al Bundy, married with children. 40 was kind of the decline of the man, right? You hit 40, and things were starting to break down. That's not the case when you really put the work in. The memory issues, people, oh, I'm losing my memory. People could say that in their 30s. I read one of the most pathetic articles I ever read. This is back when I was really doing the mindset work. Was, I wish I could find it. I would send it to you. It's maybe some, it was some blog, but it was talking about how the guys in his 30s can hardly play pickup basketball anymore, already starting to forget things. And you realize, yeah, people are in their decline in the 30s. When really, if you're a man, that's the best decade of your life. 43 is still good for me, but I'm still on the, the I'm on the downward slope. But instead of it being a cliff, it's more like, oh, so 43 is not as good as 33 because 33 to 36 is like the best years of a man's life. But I'm still better than I was when I was 25, right? So th that also keeps you from not chasing the drugs of youth. By the drugs of youth, I mean like youth obsession. What are the kids doing these days? I don't give a fuck what they think is cool. What 25-year-old men on the internet say to me, you look old. Because uh, there's always 25-year-old men, they're the equivalent of the do-nothing bitch, right? The DNBs. <laughs> they always comment on my looks. And I'm thinking, dude, I've been punched in the face so many times. I split open, done MMA, boxing, jujitsu. I'm, yeah, I'm beat up, man. But you're, what have you done? You're 25. You haven't fucking deployed to a combat zone. I have friends who are 25 who've deployed to multiple combat tours. So don't fucking, but so it's always those that kind of do nothing bitches on the internet. And I think when people get older, they want the younger people to like them. And I'm the opposite. If you're young, I think you're lucky that you found a Shaolin master. And if you don't see it that way, see you later, dude. Cause you're not fucking cool. I don't think you're cool. I don't want to be young. I don't want to be a fucked up 25 year old kid with no sense of purpose and no fully formed masculine identity so i like being old 
but but that's the big but if i had lived my life the way i did yeah i would be on the decline i'd be just another another middle-aged kind of guy the decline maybe doing a bucket list that's what you do in your 40s oh bucket list a few things i'd like to do before i die i don't even think like i can't even imagine thinking like that even go. though i know i'm gonna die soon right not that soon i just had blood work my blood works great and everything but i know i'm realistic about mortality so all of that, all of that, again, integrates, but that's compounding. That skills compounding, that's learning a new skill. I always tell people learn a new skill every year. What skill? Well, can you write well? No, well then start there. Can you speak well? No, okay, start there. And then a year later, oh, what should I do this year? Did you do a public speaking course? Did you go to Toastmasters? Are you doing speeches in front of the mirror? Okay, no, nothing more to say. But once you, once you read a lot and can speak well and can write well, you can do anything. You don't need me anymore. You know, when it comes, it, a lot of what I'm hearing, you know, you, you're on the signal. You know, you're seeing like, what are the important things? And there's not much static in your life. You've removed the distractions, the, any effective fighting unit that one of the guys broke it down to me like this. They were explaining why I've had success is when you have an objective, you're going towards it. And when little things pop off to your left and right, you, you might look at it, engage, but you don't stop to, to deal with left. You don't stop to deal with right. You keep going towards what it is you're working on while handling that shit. And that's how you achieve your goals. But for a lot of these men, you know, there is this massive static in their lives. There is this, it's okay to be comfortable. It's okay to sit down. You should be fat. You know, I'm, I just turned 34. You know, when I'm out with my kids, I, I run around with them. Like we are engaged together doing things, whether it's practicing their sports or whatever. And that's, that's sort of the, the message I've been championing is that your children will follow your example, not your advice. And for these guys, and I say guys because of the nature of the work, but for these parents, you know, it's moms too. You know, there has to be a better message out there. And do you foresee any way of that, that signal finding its way into mainstream? Because we, we homeschooled this year. So th well, last year we started for the first time full-time. My wife is a stay-at-home mom who now homeschools and we caught a lot of shit both for her leaving the job and for us pulling the kids out of school. And, that, and that's important too, though. I think you should, I think you should talk about that more is there. It's good to be men focused and help men, but it's also good to give men a more well-rounded. And that was one of my early failures as a writer, a more well-rounded understanding of women in terms of it's not easy for them either. They want to be a stay at home mom. The shame happens. They want to homeschool Oh, are you a crazy anti-vax mom? Your kids are going to be socially awkward. They're dealing with all that bullshit too, socially. So it isn't like society even has the best interest of women in their mind either. Society is going, to, or the system, the matrix is going after women too. It's just a different vector of attack. So with the man, they're saying, be more like a woman, be more a feet. And then with women, they're telling them, go be some corporate drone. So everybody's getting, everybody's getting a bad message Culturally, it's not going to change on a big level, but it doesn't have to change. We only need 10% of the population. That's why, that's why I've always been very terse and very unapologetic in my writing. I don't need the weak men. I don't need to somehow spend all my days, oh, here's why you shouldn't be a pathetic loser. No, you're a pathetic loser, dude, and that's fine, but you can't be a pathetic. I always tell people, go be a loser somewhere else because you can't do it around me. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want you to live a bad life. I want the best for your life, but you can't do that around me. You can come up to my level. You can come up to my level because I don't need, there's a practicality in that because I don't need them. We just, we need 10% of the culture. 10, there's a essay that, that's why, by the way, the far left is winning. There's a, mathematically, he claims to have proved it. We'll, you know, we'll leave that to other people to determine, but like Nassim Taleb said, the most intolerant wins. And by that, I mean, you just, you need 10% of the people to just say, no, you're, we're not going to do this. Nope, we're just not going to do it. And then the 10% of the people to unite, say, no, we're not going to do it. That's what happened. I got a lot of heat for a tweet that I made because I, I don't know why a lot of my audience doesn't like um, Islam. I like Muslims and I like Islam. And I think it's a great Abrahamic religion. I have great respect for Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Most people don't know it all came from the same area. They want to focus on one bad scripture, which is what atheists, I find interesting. That's what atheists do. Oh, here's a bad scripture from the Bible. 
therefore the Bible's a religion of death or something. How dare they do that? But then they'll say, oh, well, Muhammad did this one thing. Like, okay, you're looking at one scripture. You don't actually read the text. You don't know what you're talking about. But in any event, what happened was in a few parts of the UK, these public schools tried to indoctrinate kids into stuff that was pretty bad. And the, the Muslim parents just said, okay, our kids aren't going to school anymore. They didn't respond to shame. They didn't respond. They just said, nope, they're just not going to school anymore. Bye. They all pulled their kids out. What happened? It's perfect. <laughs> Curriculum went away. Right? That's what happened. That, that's, that's all you need. You just need people to say, okay, our kids just aren't going to school anymore. Bye. See ya. What do you mean? No, that's wrong, right? They, they try to shame you and guilt you and use all those slam. No, no, nope, we're just not going to do it anymore. And, and that's what you need. The lockdowns brought out a lot of that energy because initially everybody was kind of on board in terms of, okay, this thing could be really bad, myself included. Let's see what happens. We saw what happened. And we thought, okay, now it's just a power grab. We know what it is. And although the bad guys won, they didn't win by the margin they thought they would win, right? They thought they would win by a much larger margin than they did. So that's raising up the next kind of 10% of people. So you had the gym owner who just said, I'm just not going to close my gym. They, it, arrest me, dude. You had that with churches finally, where they just said, arrest me, dude. That's what we need 10% of the country to just do. No. So just everybody goes to church. If a church has a thousand members, everybody goes to church. Here, a hundred people are willing to be arrested. How many police departments are going to arrest a hundred people in every town? You only, because I said, you only need 10%. Say everybody comes to church. I need a hundred of you prepared to be arrested and you're going to go stand right by the door. You get a hundred people. That's again, only 10%. Every, you do that in every city. You're going to have police force is going to arrest 100 people, book them, process them into jail. So th that started happening a little bit in California to the point where where I live, the sheriff wouldn't even enforce the orders. G Governor Newsom issued an edict saying basically he was trying to relock down everything. San Bernardino sheriff said, which is more rural. No, we just won't enforce it. Orange County, which is pretty red. No, we're just not going to enforce it. So guess what? Everybody's living their life like normal, subject to some, you know, reasonable, I think, restrictions. That's what you needed. And that has happened. So in, in that way, I'm optimistic. We are against dark forces, but enough people have said enough is enough, and there's no limit to the totalitarianism. So we are going to push back. And again, we don't need everybody. We don't need everybody to be a, a, a protester, a peaceful protester. We only need 10% of the people to just, we got 1,000 people in church. Here's 100 people. They're willing to be arrested. Stand, hold the line, hold the line in front of everyone else and just here, give them, give them your hands too. Don't fight them. Don't, don't make a scene. Don't do that shit that people did at the Capitol. Nothing like that. Just say, let them take you in. Let them take a hundred people in. That would end it quick. Right. But we still don't quite have that yet, but we're, I think we're getting there. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, and it's, it's great. Sometimes I'm afraid I'm in an echo chamber with the dudes I talk to online. Cause I'm seeing them crush it. I'm like, yeah. And then I look around me in the real world. I'm like, ah, I don't know. You know, well, it's we always been like that. There was a great audio book, the saddest secret in the world or the strangest secret in the world. I think it was Earl Nightingale. He was an early Dale Carnegie kind of person. And he did this audio in I think the 1950s. And he said, you know, by the time a man's 50, if you take a hundred men, by the time they're 50, 93 will have have done not much some some number have gone broke and one of them will have sort of made it so it's always been the case that there's always going to be a small percentage of people rich piano called it the five percent which i think he got from thinking grow rich there was a i think it was thinking grow rich where they said like whatever it takes right and that was rich piano's very smart appropriation of that which are you willing to do whatever it takes well, that's always going to be a small percentage of people. That's always going to be 1% or 3% or 5%, may, you know, maybe 10%. It's always going to be the case, and that's fine. But that's why my focus has always been on that segment of society. Are you going to do this thing? No. Okay. I'm not here to argue with you. I'm not here to hold your hand. You're fine. That's just the law of the world, unfortunately. Now, when it comes to, you know, you mentioned the, 
the saddest secret or whatever the, the title of that book i can't think of it. i think you said the saddest secret you know when you look at the vector of attack you're talking about you know and, and the forces that be i think there are a lot of things happening that parents are completely oblivious to because they're looking at the 50s you know maybe the 80s maybe even the 2000s and the issues they faced as kids coming up and we're living in a whole different world right now you know it, it's almost like you have to have you have to update yourself as a father you need to be a modern father fit for modern times and modern problems you know and you were talking earlier about turning 18 and getting your only fans there are there are parents out there who don't even realize what the, the message being sent to their children you know do you want to talk a little bit about the, these modern problems we're facing and it, it's a shitty subject i hate talking about it. it makes me sick to my stomach but these kids are being groomed and it's just my, my son's 11 my daughter's eight you know they are children they should be, be kids going out into the world and, and climbing falling down whatever and i've got to worry about you know some of the sick shit that is both not only marketed you know online in these sneaky ways through uh, videos and shows but also you know even in school systems even in you know these very publicly accepted things where you saw that one boy who i, I don't know if he's a considered a boy you know the transgender but he was like eight, nine, 10, 11 years old at a, a gay nightclub dancing around and people are cheering for his bravery. And I'm like, wait, what the fuck are we doing? That is, that is somebody's son. Why are we championing this? This is not okay. And it's just like parents look the other way because maybe it's a dark secret or maybe again, it's always been there. And again, I'm just, I'm that jaded dude because I'm online no, seeing no, it. No, it's never like that. When I was in, so I'm 43, graduate high school, 96. There, it was the norm for people to still be virgins in high school. That was the norm. People having sex in junior high, no, 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 inconceivable. And now that that's all encroached into junior high now. To it's like the boiling point in the frog. It's one degree though, inch yeah. by inch by inch. Yeah, and, and you're busy with life. And if you don't upgrade your own knowledge about the world, I, I, the example I like to give is that if you ask me off the top of my head, how many people in the world, what's the world population? I would think probably 6 billion because when I learned it, it was 6 billion. And if you don't go and regularly update, I think last time it was like 9 billion to 10.5 billion, something like that. But you learn something and that's sort of what you know about the world. And when I went to school, public schools were amazing. The, I mean, you got bullied and there was the hyena impact of kids, unfortunately, and often kids in, in bad home environments, hurting each other, hurt people, hurt people. But our teachers were good, dude. We learned, didn't you know their politics. You probably could have guessed if you were an adult, but they didn't push stuff on you. You did the basic homework. And that's what people kind of would, would assume then. Oh yeah, I'm going to send my kid to public school. They're just going to learn stuff, how to do math, write in cursive, whatever, whatever. No, it's completely changed now, depending on where you are, where it's actually indoctrination into a far left-wing orthodoxy. We not, fortunately now though, with the teachers unions, people are saying, well, wait a minute, these teachers unions are actually bad. It used to be everybody loved, if you wanted to be loved in, in, in my era, if you wanted to be loved, you'd be a mailman, a fireman, a nurse, or a teacher, maybe a doctor. Everybody, right, everybody loves a mailman, you can't blame him when he brings you bills, right? Maybe he's just doing his job. The fireman you like, police, you know, maybe you've had a run in before. Everybody loves a nurse. Everybody loved teachers when I grew up. It was, a, it was a revered, respected profession. And I think they deserved it, at least the ones that I experienced. You had a couple, I had a couple ones that weren't very good, but I didn't have like a really bad teacher who was a nasty person. And now you look at these teachers' unions, might as well be a different world. I don't even, I don't even recognize it. So if you aren't that, that is again, though, about self-development, self-development is always learning the new way to train, right? Science is changing. There's a better way to train. There's a better way to, to learn. There's better nutrition. There's better quality food. There's better quality knowledge about the world. Everything's changing. And your mindset can't be fixed. Your mindset has to always be abundant and oriented towards leveling up in the world. And then part of that is, hey, what are they teaching my kids, right? And then part of that is talking to your kids. Because, you know, you have kids. Everybody listening has kids. Your kids will tell you what's going on if you listen. If you're checked in, you'll know what they learned that day fast. But if you're 
more because my parents were a little bit more absentee. If you're more of an absentee parent, you're not going to know any of this. But that's why the stuff that goes viral, it's parents who are doing their homework with their kids. They're not just saying, hey, do your homework, kid. They're saying, let me see what's your homework. Let me sit down with you for half an hour at the table. Let me sit with you for an hour. And by the way, another thing I didn't know is they're giving kindergartners homework now. So for me, even before the, the craziness in schools, we were never going to, I would never send my kid to do homework in kindergarten. And negative. Never. <laughs> A lot of them get three hours, three hours. I was like, that can't possibly be true. You look into it because the world has changed so much. I'm often saying that possibly, can, that po can't possibly be true. Oh no, it's just like the norm now. Because the idea is college prep, extracurriculars. If you want to get a good college, you have to train these habits. Three hours of homework as a kid, that's torture, right? That's torture. But that's, what, that's the norm. So for us, even orthodoxy aside, we were never going to put our kid in that kind of environment. You know, I think it's important for parents to realize, and I, I always stress this in each episode, to not just listen to the podcast, but to apply the information. Don't just watch the YouTube video apply the information. Don't just read the fucking book, apply the info to your life to get the changes. And that's, that I'm really glad you brought that up because those are the actions, you know, sitting down and talking to the kid, removing the taboo. You know, it shouldn't be weird to talk about sex. If they saw something, politics, money, you know, I'm talking to my kids about crypto, you know, I'm talking about all, all the things going on in the world, because that's just, if it's a part of my world, it's a part of their world. And if I want them at 18 to not be hopping on an OnlyFans, <laughs> I need to ensure that the grooming and the, the education that they're receiving in the development of their moral and values, that compass they have, you know, you instill that in the home. You don't just expect somebody else to raise that kid. You know, it's, it's not anybody else's why, job to bring them up. And I'm not anti-public school, but if I were in an area where, well, I, I would, I don't think it, that would work out for me given the disinformation about me, but I would want to be on the school board. I, that would be my deal is if my kids were in public school, then I would be at that level. I want to be on the school board. I want to know what their curriculum is. I want to look at the textbooks. I want to know what's actually going to happen. So I tell a lot of people, hey, I get it, man. We're all in different situations in life. I'm not saying everybody, to use an overused word, privileged, not everybody necessarily is where I am in life. But that doesn't mean that you can't make your own life better. Your kids have to go to public school. Your wife has to work. Hey, man. Cool. No judgment for me. Everybody's situation is different, but you can look at the textbooks, right? You remember going to school, you get your textbooks at the beginning of the year. You can look at the textbooks. You can see what books they're having your kids reading. You can be the squeaky wheel. You can say, oh, you know why we're reading this thing. You, you can do that. Not only can you do that, but you should do that. And that's the way that you can be involved. I always tell people, if you can't afford to give to charity, give blood. There's always something that you can do karmically that's good for the world that's good for humanity that's good for your own soul and then you know the law of attraction and abundance means that the more you do and the more energy you put out means you're going to get more back so it's actually being unselfish is selfish so there's always more you can do you can say yeah i mean i have to work i have a crappy job i hate it it's where i am we all are. like my dad couldn't have just been a an entrepreneur right he worked in factories you're going to tell some guy with three kids 28 a bipolar wife who's barely functional. Hey, dude, quit your job, start a blog. Absurd. <laughs> Absurd. So I'll, I'm, I've never been that guy who's like, you can just go start a podcast, get a Patreon, make a living on the I've never been that guy. I've always been the guy saying, yeah, man, I mean, you're, you're probably going to have to work in factories a while. That doesn't mean you can't look for some kind of side business or you can't do a little bit more. Hey, man, cool. I, amazing. My dad worked in factories. I love factory workers. My dad's worked his whole life on junkyards now in his 60s. My grandpa worked till he was 91, recently died. He went to work until the last six months of his life, maybe. So I'm, I'm pro. Be, be a working guy. Be a working class guy. Don't be unrealistic. But you can know what your kids are reading. That doesn't take that much time. It doesn't take that much energy. We all know you're tired. We all know, you know, you come home work boots, you can barely take them off. You might have to have your kids pull your work boots off because you're that beat down. We all get that. And we understand that point of view. So we're not saying go homeschool your kids. We're just saying, hey, man, check the curriculum out. See, see, because maybe your public school is actually good. Hey, you talk to your kids, find out, but don't probe. 
the the conversational style that doesn't work is the is when you don't have a natural organic conversational relationship with your kids and you're just like sit at the table talk about your day no how you know how was interrogation your day? get that light bulb overhead <laughs> yeah yeah no what do you mean the kid doesn't even know but we just have a fluent conversation with your children the stuff is going to come out and you'll you'll know right away what's going on yeah, that brings me to pretty the, the final point i really wanted to to address and that's where we talk a lot about be the change you want to see so i created a, a 31 day challenge i'm like all right here's how you can reinvent yourself you have a master class you know and in that i wanted to know if you could talk a little about the psychology of fear because i think a lot of these men they're they're at the point now, maybe they're listening to this podcast and they're like, all right, I don't really know who I am as a man. And I've got to start there. I've got to start with me. You know, that's what we've been hitting. Start at the micro and that'll impact the macro. You know, how do they get over or how can they face that pushback? And, and with your masterclass, what's the approach you take to helping these people find that sense of self so they go out into the world and then they can be that beacon of what right looks like for their wife, for their kids. You know, maybe that hits another family. So how does your masterclass run and specifically you know, the pushback that they're going to face when they start to improve themselves by the, the crabs in the bucket, if you will. Yeah, the well, the crabs in the bucket is easiest one. You just have to cut those people out. The people who tell you, I always say, you're not telling me anything cool telling me why I can't do something. Any asshole in the world can tell you why something's not going to work. The bigger picture we focus on with the master class is that because there's only two emotions in the world, right? Love and fear. Every emotion is love or love based or fear based. Everything holding you back is rooted in fear. I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to look inadequate. I'm embarrassed. It's to the point, and we talked about this in the book of Royal Mindset too, where the, like the conversation in your head is I'm going to look stupid. But if I tell you, hey, dude, go into a room by yourself. No one can hear you. Practice a speech in front of the mirror. Well, I'm going to look stupid. To who, motherfucker? There's nobody there. There's nobody in the room with you. That's your own mental conditioning. That's the voices. I always say, I did a podcast on this like years ago. The voices in your head aren't fucking your voice. That's not you. That's your parents telling you you can't do something or leadership people or negative people or society telling you, oh, this is dumb. Why would you do this? You didn't come up with that shit. Somebody else is playing that in your mind. So there's the heart aspect of you know, loving yourself. There's the mental aspect of realizing, hey, he's right. How, how can I look stupid? Nobody can actually even see me here. This is so dumb. I didn't play, so I'm going to rewrite those voices in my head. And then you want to feel that the thump, the thump, the thump, the thump. If you're not feeling that, you're not pushing yourself. I'm going to go take a chance. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. I, I feel that fear all the time. I feel the fear when I do ayahuasca, um, where you, you try to talk yourself out of things. That, that, but so the first step is you have to recognize when what's going to come to the surface. So the minute you do something challenging, you're going to start talking yourself out of it. You know, for me, for example, with doing ayahuasca, I go there every time I do, every time I do it, I'm on my way there. And I think, why would you do this? Your life is perfect. You don't need to do. So it might even come in a very flattering way, that little, in the, the war of art, Stephen Pressfield calls it resistance. We all have a, that resistance that bubbles up. It might charm you. It might say, it might not say you're a coward. You're afraid to do this, to talk you. Cause that kind of psychology doesn't work for me. If you tell me you're a coward, then I'm going to do it. Maybe to my own detriment. I actually had to learn that I people were able to bait me into things. That's the wrong way to do it. The way you get me or the way the resistance that Stephen Presserfield calls it or the demons that I call them, whatever you want to call them, they might flatter you. Hey, man, you don't need to do this thing. Your life is good, bro. Why in the world are you about to sit with a cup of tea and somebody on the internet claims you can have a bad trip? You might you know, be loony, da, 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 da. People are going to judge you. No one will understand. That's when I know that I'm in the fear zone. That's when you know that's growth happens in the pain zone and the free zone, the, the fear zone, right? That's what because you're in the fear zone when you're trying to talk yourself out of it. No one's ever trying to talk themselves out of watching TV. Oh, you had a long day, brother. You had a long day, man. You're kind of tired. Just just relax a little bit. You don't need to go to the gym. 
you know, you're actually not that bad of shape. You're not really that fat. You're not really that skinny. Things are going pretty good, dude. Why are you going to mess it up? So the, the fear voice comes in when you hit the fear zone and it could be, but if you're a different mindset than me, then it'll be negative. The negative mindset will be like, you're afraid to do this. And you'll say, yeah, I guess I am afraid to do this. Yeah, it's not for me. Those people kind of like slunk away. So for me, when you hit the fear zone, it's the flattery and the charm. Why do this, bro? You're doing great, man. Everything in life is perfect for you. Why would you up in the table? Why would you take another chance? Why would you try to do this? And that for me is very seductive. That's the voice you have to watch out for. But the flip side is it, the voice is going to come the other way too. So it'll flatter you. I actually tell people to really understand fear. I think that the best, not the best, but one of the top 10 books is Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. And the plot of the, the, plot of the, the book is that the day you're born, the devil himself assigns a demon to, to you. And his job is to get you in hell. And he has your entire life to get you into hell. That's his only goal, to get you to forsake Christ. Even if people don't believe in Christ and they have a different religious practice, I'm not here to, to do judging on that. The metaphor is, that's how I think of life. There's a demon assigned to me the day I was born. And that demon knows me and he's going to realize, okay, so I can't insult Cernovich because that'll make him just lean into it even more and say, you think you're going to beat me down? No, not going to happen. So then the demon's going to fly. Oh, why do that, man? Everything is good, dude. You don't need to push yourself harder. You're getting kind of older. You've earned it. You've earned it, bro. You've earned it. That seduction. So people, everybody should read that book because it's so, so beautiful and eloquent how the situation is described. But then you'll start to notice, again, even metaphorically, don't even take it literally. I actually take it literally. I do think they're demons assigned to us and their job is to, to bring us into hell and an eternal damnation. But just look at the metaphor. Once you look at it metaphorically, you realize, yeah, why is it that when I really get going, I get some momentum, people either come at me with hate or they come at me with flattery. Hey, Zach, what? Come on, man. Come hang out with us, bro. Don't you like us anymore? They're not maybe not, not talking shit. They're not saying, oh, you're pussy whipped and you're just with your wife, you little bitch. You know, they, they might do that to some people because that'll work on some people because the demon knows that's how you get that guy. But the demon might say, hey, man, we really miss you. Come on, man. Come to the bar. Let's see some nachos. Let's drink. Let's watch the game. Let's spend eight hours together. It'll be, it'll be fun, bro. Just like old times. And then you think, well, yeah, I mean, a cold brew sounds pretty nice right now. Nacho sound. I mean, it sounds pretty good with me right now. I'm probably tempting people right now thinking, thinking that you recognize that when you say, no, 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 I'm going to take myself into the fear zone again. So you want to constantly be taking yourself into the fear zone. No, that's excellent. I mean, so it's pretty, it's weird. You brought up the screw tape letters because I ordered it two days ago. It arrived yesterday. <laughs> And I've never See, read it before. Uh, long to dive in. Dude, that's, that's weird. When you brought that up, I was like, holy shit. Like literally, <laughs> I just got that book. I'm looking forward to diving into it. Because God speaks to us too. That, that's the whole idea is we, it's not like we're left alone. We have angels protecting us too. We have angels giving us divine, divine messaging, which is it's something I never talked about because people go, oh, you talk a lot about faith. You talk a lot about spirituality a lot. Is that like a new thing? But people who followed me knew that in 2011, I did a big podcast. And I said, I'm going to start talking about God more, but the time is not right to talk about God. People aren't ready. And if I talked the way that I do now, I would have been completely dismissed and my message wouldn't be received. But now when I talk about God, the atheism is dead, right? Nobody wants to hear your, your atheism, your amoral godlessness. Nobody wants to hear about your weak sinful life and you're sinning. Nobody wants to hear that. People want to hear about spirituality, religion. So it's change. So I've always told people that you also have angels there to give you messaging and you have angels to give you power and you have divine energy. And then as you go in through the fear zone, you're tapping into divine energy. You're tapping into your higher self. You're tapping into the entire collective energy of the universe, the collective energy of God, the mind of God. You're merging your mind with God. That's when people talk about flow. That's when people talk about the muse. That's when people talk about creativity. You're, you're connecting with God also. So it isn't just you have a demon assigned to you, but you do. But you also have angels assigned to you too. 
and you're caught between two worlds, the worlds of good and evil. And for, again, to the parents listening or to anybody listening to this, you know, it's easy to say, I want the best for my kids. I want the best for my friends. I want the best for my family. But if you're not going to get the best for you, if you're not going to fight to be the best you, you don't love them that much. You don't love them enough to do the hard inner work required to give them your best. Like the, put the mask on yourself so you can help them. My wife can't get the best me unless I'm willing to invest in me. My kids can't get the best dad and then so on and so forth to my, my parents, my siblings, my community. You know, it's, it's imperative that as men, we invest in our growth and our continued growth, the sustained growth in order to give the best for them to live it. They're going to follow that example we set. So I have a link to- Yeah, they're going to, which is true conceptually, but that's where I bridge the gap between concept and practice in the book Gorilla Mindset and also in the master class. Because we want to, we want to, of course, share the message of pushing yourself harder. But the question is, how do you know that you're pushing yourself harder? And then that's where you look for, you look for the boom, 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 the shortness of breath. Okay, I'm, I'm shortness of breath now. I can barely talk now. My mouth is getting a little bit dry. I'm getting that cotton mouth. Now you're in the fear zone. That's good. So you got to put yourself in the fear zone too, challenging yourself in different ways. You got to find comfort in discomfort. You know, because when you look at discomfort, guess what word is closing that thing out? Comfort. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. Well, the good news too is when you get older, it's in a way for me easier to lift because I'm always sore anyway. So if, if you don't go to the gym and you're in your 40s, you're going to have aches and pains. And if you go to the gym, you're going to have aches and pains. Whereas when you're younger, you're sore when you go to the gym. So it's actually kind of nice. That's why I always tell people the pain's coming anyway. I would say the pain is coming anyway. You might as well inflict the pain on yourself now too, because you're not going to avoid it. The pain's coming. And then you're ready for it when it hits. And it will hit. I mean, it's going to hit. You're going to get it nuked. <laughs> All right, Mike, this has been a solid discussion. For people that, so I have a link to the masterclass below, but anybody that wants to reach out to you and find more of your work, What's the best way they can do so? I mean, I'm all over the internet. The best thing is um, my the only place to get my back podcast library is rockfin.com forward slash Cernovich. So that's R-O-K-F-I-N.com forward slash Cernovich. That has everything we've talked about, but I've done episodes elaborating on like every concept that we just talked about. So there's, I don't know, probably hundreds of hours of, of back library of podcasts there. And that's only $9.95 a month. And you could probably, um, you know, just go through that, read the book, Gorilla Mindset, the masterclass, the masterclass people have really liked this done well. And then the whole back podcast library for rockfin.com forward slash Cernovich. Awesome. I'll have a link to that below. I want to thank you again for your time. I know you're a busy man. I'm really glad we we're able to link up. This was an awesome talk. You know, a lot of takeaways, a lot of applicable advice shared, you know, and to everybody listening again, now that you've listened to the talk, Go apply it. Go live it. Go put it into your life. Thanks, brother. Yes, sir. Thank you. For everybody that tuned in, all those links are below. Check it out. I want to thank you for listening. This has been another episode on the Family Alpha Podcast.